across the building if you would. And uh, as you stand with us tonight, we'd like to do something real quick. I'm going to have one more song for the preacher preaches tonight here in just a minute. I'll talk to James about it in a second. But what we like to do is we like to have a little time of fellowship, not like you did when the choir come down, but what we like for you to do is to look around you until you find someone that you do not know their name. You don't know their name. And then we like for you to introduce yourself to them and them introduce themselves to you and tell you who they are. And so I'm going to get Miss Amy, if she would, to play for us. And I want you to take us a couple, two, three minutes here. Find somebody tonight you don't know. And uh, I know Brother Chad's got some folks here tonight. I know a lot of y'all don't know them. All right? And so find someone you do not know and tell them you're glad to see them in the house of God this evening. Miss Amy, if you play for us. Anyway, he does a song right before Brother Cock and Dog preaches. It's one of my favorite songs. Every year I'm down preaching in Plant City, Florida at the uh, Minus with Blank. Wow, preacher, that's terrible. Ain't it? Hold on, don't tell me. I'm going to get this. Plant City, Florida, Brother Kelly's Church. Harmony Baptist Church. <laughs> God for the pastor of Calvary. She helps us a lot. Amen. Great jubilee down there every year in March where everybody's up here preaching. I go down there in Florida. Get to preach every year. I'm having to pay him more each year to come, but he still lets me come. But anyway, Brother Roland, uh, we've got we got the piano players, we got the deal. I think you better. We want you to do oh what a savior. Can you do that? Amen. And I love to hear Brother Roland sing this song. We'll get them the mics up here. Come on up here if you would, preacher. Love this dear family. Humble, sweet people. Love God. And uh, they are they're Yankees, but they're good Yankees. They're uh, Pennsylvania. And become good friends of ours. I'm in a lot of meetings with them. Are you glad you're in church tonight? Yeah. You know what amazes me? You look like you are. Isn't it great when a Baptist looks like they're glad to be in church? Do you know it's okay to smile? And be excited. Brother Kyle drove all the way here from Georgia, close to five hours. And we got to give him a best tonight when we're helping him, right? Yeah. But I love this song. And uh, what a savior we have. Amen. Yeah. You be seated. Enjoy them. Then we'll get to preach your church. Oh, mm -hmm. 
the word of God and help us. He's the pastor of Crossroads Baptist Church down uh, preacher, I, I say Atlanta, but really it's Lawrenceville, right? Down in Lawrenceville, Georgia. And his name is Brother Kenny Kuykendall. Uh, he's an author, a preacher. I think he you, you can do a little songwriting. Amen. A little bit. And uh, just a joy to have him with us. And he's going to come. You give him his, your attention tonight. He's going to preach for us. Pastor, thank you so much for being at Calvary tonight. Good to have you back. Good to have you back. Yeah. You want that stool? I do. Oh. <laughs> Glad you're saved tonight, Sam. Glad yeah. you can't lose it. Shout glory. Glory. I'm saved, sealed, signed, delivered. I'm ready to go. How about you? Yeah. Ask Brother Paquette if I could use his stool tonight as I preach, but I know as soon as I climb up on it, I climb up off. Right. Right. So, I appreciate being back here tonight and uh, what a joy it is to see how God is moving and working at Calvary and what, what a great facility God has given you. I love this church. I love your dear pastor. What a great man of God he is tonight. I'm glad I'm saved. How about you? Yeah. What a great joy it is to be saved. You, you can be seated tonight. I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Joshua. The Old Testament book of Joshua. As uh, I was climbing up, I was kind of serious about that stool climbing up on it. And when you're only five foot eight, man, you need all the height you can get. And uh, there was a guy asked me years ago, he said, Preacher, have you always been short? And I thought just a minute, I said, No, I used to be real, real tall. I said, Over the process of time, I just got shorter. I said, Have you always been stupid? And, uh, we didn't have really good answer. You know, uh, I have found one thing about being short. One thing that's good. Nobody knows when you got a booger in your nose. Amen? <laughs> Joshua chapter number 6 tonight. 
I was uh, telling the preacher, I realize this is Jubilee, and uh, I've been asking God to give us the message for the hour. And uh, it seems like the Lord's not really giving me a Jubilee message. And I don't know, it seems like that's what you have to this week. And so, uh, anyway, uh, I think God knows what we need, don't you? And it's amazing how God can coordinate a week like this, bring us all together in different places, different churches, and different ministries. And he's got prepared exactly what we need to go forward in the faith. And so tonight as we look at the Word of God, Joshua chapter number 6, I want to tell you without any apology, I hold my hands the inerrant scripture of God's holy word. This is the Word of God. And it's not just the Word of God, it's the Word of God for us. And it's not just the Word of God for us, it's the Word of God for us to live. Amen. And to breathe Amen. and exercise in our life. The Bible says in verse number 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. No one out, none came in. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Threefold promise God gave to Joshua. Right. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, we got a little taste of that tonight, didn't we? Right. All the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Heavenly Father, as I come to you tonight, I realize, God, that I will fail in my flesh. God, I realize tonight that I have nothing in and of myself to give these people of an eternal value. God, if anything happens good, it will be because you've done it. God, we pray tonight that you would fill us with the Holy Ghost of God. God, we stand and we confess that we need you in this hour. God, I pray that you'd overshadow your servant tonight and use me. God, I ask you, God, to use me tonight. And God, above and beyond that, I pray you open up the hearts of the hearers of the Word of God. God, I pray that you would find a lodging place, Lord, somewhere in our life. God, that we can leave this place different than the way that we came in. Thank you for this great church tonight. Thank you. God, for what you're doing here at Calvary. Thank you for Brother Hazlett. God, what he means to me. God, the friend that he's been down the years. And God, I pray that you give him a double portion of your blessing. We'll give you praise and honor and glory. For it's in your wonderful name we try to pray. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. I want you tonight to take your attention to verse number 5 in the Word of the Lord. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Word, I want you to underline this statement, verse number 5. Where the Bible says, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And I want to preach tonight with the help of the Lord on this thought. We all have walls that need to fall. We all have walls that need to fall. When you come to Joshua chapter number 6, you'll discover that this is one of the great transitional passages in all of the Word of God. This is the moment in time where God has given the children of Israel all of the land of promise. Right. As you understand the context here, you will discover that God indeed has brought the children of Israel out of some things. You go back just a few chapters and just a few books and you'll discover that God brought these people out of the land of bondage. There they had served Pharaoh for 430 years. And in bitterness and in brokenness and in bondage, they had labored and built the great city of Egypt. But God raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses and called them out of bondage. He called them out of the burdens. He called them out of the trials of their faith. What a wonderful picture that is for you and I who have been called out of the bondage of sin. Yeah. We've been called out of the bondage of our taskmaster. May I remind you tonight before we get too high and mighty, where we came from is not where we are today. We came from a pit of hell. We came where our father was the devil. We came from the bondage of depravity and depression and discouragement. But I'm glad to tell you on a Friday night, I'm not what I'm going to be. 
But thank God I'm not what I used to be. And I'm not where I'm going to be. But I'm glad I'm not where I used to be. And as you come to Joshua chapter number 6, God has delivered the children of Israel out of the burdens and the bondage of life. Over the last 40 years, He's also led them out of the barrenness and out of the bitterness of the wilderness. For 40 years, God provided for them in the howling wastelands of life. God, would you believe it if I told you, was able to bring water out of the rock. God was able to bring bread out of the ovens of glory. God was able to prepare them and provide for them and protect them there in the wilderness. And now in Joshua chapter number 6, the children of Israel has already crossed over the Jordan River. The second generation of God's people have risen up, the Joshua generation. And God is about to do something for them that He has promised down through the years. Does it not amaze you tonight that God, even as He parted the Red Sea for Moses and his generation, has parted the Jordan waters for Joshua and for his generation, just for one more reminder that what I did in days gone by, I can and will do again. God has led them out. He's bringing them in. And He's telling them, I'm going to give you all the promises of the land of Canaan. Here in Joshua chapter number 6, we discover God has not just brought them out of something. He's about to bring them into something. That's a wonderful picture of the abundant, victorious Christian life. God has not just brought us out of our sin. He's not just brought us out of our hell. He's not just brought us out of our depravity. He's not just brought us out of our iniquity. But aren't you glad tonight? He's constantly bringing in to the victorious, abundant, hallelujah, glory-filled life. So God says, I promise you the land of Canaan. I promised Abraham the land of Canaan. And I promised Isaac the land of Canaan. And I promised Jacob the land of Canaan. And I promised Joseph the land of Canaan. And I promised Moses the land of Canaan. And Joshua, I'm promising you the land of Canaan. I'm going to give you the city of Jericho. I'm going to give you the king thereof. And all the mighty men of valor. Aren't you glad tonight you can bank on the promises of God? You can trust in His word. Everything that He said, it can and will come to pass if we'll just keep abiding in His promise. So God's bringing them out. He's about to bring them in. But the one thing that's going to stand in their way of getting all that God has prepared for them all these years is the walls of Jericho. God says, I've given you wells that you did not have to dig. Right. I've given you homes that you did not have to build. Right. And I've given you vineyards that you did not have to plant. Oh, what a glorious life that God has for the children of Israel beyond Joshua chapter 6. But we got a problem in Joshua chapter number 6. What is standing in the way of them receiving everything that God had promised, not just their forefathers, but had promised them, was embodied in this great wall known as the city of Jericho. Jericho literally, spiritually, physically is standing in the way of them moving forward in the faith. As you look at this wall tonight, the city of Jericho, I would surmise to you in this building this evening, we all too have walls that need to fall. Walls hinder us. Walls prevent us. Walls restrict us. Walls will stop us from going further. And can I just say this tonight? You're looking at a preacher that has not yet arrived. I don't have it all figured out. And I have the enemies to fight. And I have discouraging days. And I'll just be very transparent tonight. Sometimes I look at the walls in my life and think, how am I ever going to get over these? And I just say it again, we all have walls that need to fall. And can I tell you this? I'm not trying to be a TV preacher, but God does want to fulfill His promises in your life. And God does want you to operate in faith. And God does want you to move forward. And God does want you to have blessing. And God does want you to have joy. And God does want to fill your soul with the glory of heaven. And God does want you to have fruit. And He does you to win people to the Lord, and He does want you to be joyful in this life, not just the one to come, but sometimes the wall stands in our way and prevents us from going further. I'll 
say tonight as we look at these walls that need to fall, first of all, look at the dimension of the wall. The dimensions of the wall. Wow. Now, they should not be surprised in Joshua 6 when they faced Jericho because Moses in Deuteronomy 9 told the people of God just before he dismissed himself from the leadership, he said, you will go into the land of Canaan and thou art to pass over this day and possess, possess the nations that are greater and mightier than thyself with cities that have great and fenced up walls to the heavens. Right. He told them that before they ever saw it. Right. Yeah. So as they crossed over Jordan, <laughs> consecrated themselves and got ready to embark on the promises of God, suddenly what Moses had told them had come to pass. This is my, not in my notes, but I do want to say this. We ought to listen to them, old men of God. Amen. Because they've received a word from the Lord. Yes, sir. Moses told Joshua to tell the people, there's going to be some walls before you get to the land of Canaan. Amen. And as they come to the wall of Jericho, I want you to understand, this is not some little fenced up city. Right. As a matter of fact, if you go on AIG, Ken Ham's uh, internet site, you'll discover that archaeologists, they have unveiled large portion, portions of the city of Jericho and discovered that the walls of Jericho were nearly insurmountable for human efforts. efforts. Yeah. They say if an uh, Israelite stood at the base of the wall there at Jericho, that the first exterior wall stood 15 feet high. Behind that wall is another supporting wall that stood an additional 20 feet beyond the initial 15 feet high on that exterior wall. So you understand, just looking up at that first wall was a 35-foot wall. They said that there was a large embankment that slowed nearly 30 feet beyond that wall to another wall. So much so that people even lived on the walls of that city. They said that chariots would race around those walls. You remember Rahab in the Word of God. She lived upon that wall. Let me say, if a harlot can live upon such a wall, this isn't a little wall, would you say? Then they say the interior wall goes up an additional 20 feet beyond and beyond the 35 feet and the 20 feet then the other wall of the 20 feet. Preacher, what do you say? I am saying tonight that if you're an Israelite and you have come to the land of Canaan and you have found this wall, you're looking up nearly seven stories high at a wall that cannot be passed with human strength and human ingenuity. Preacher, what do you say tonight? I'm saying this. That sometimes the walls in our life are so big right. and so deep and so high and so thick right. and so long that in and of ourselves, we really don't know how to get those walls down. Right. Right. And I, I find three observations about this wall, the dimensions of the wall. First of all, I want to tell you this. This kind of wall is not built overnight. Right. 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 This wall takes time to build. This kind of wall was not built in a day. It was not built in a month. I would even surmise that it probably wasn't even built in a year. This kind of wall took time to build. There was a lot of energy put into building this wall. There was a lot of sweat put into building this wall. There was a lot of blood that was shed putting this wall. And before they realized it, they're looking at a wall that didn't just pop up overnight. They're looking at a wall that somebody had invested in for years and for years and for years. Right. And tonight, can I tell you something? Sometimes the walls that we face, they didn't just get here this morning. Yeah. Yeah. The struggles that we endure, they didn't just happen last week. Right. No, but what's happened over the process of time, brick by brick and mortar by mortar, and day after day, suddenly we built walls in our life, and we wonder how did we get there. And as we look over the course of the weeks and the days gone by, suddenly we built things. We built things so high, so big. And what does say, preacher, what's the problem with that? It's stopping us from getting further in our faith. I heard about that old couple that they got married. They loved one another over the process of time. They just start, stopped talking to each other, got bitter with each other, and they resorted in just to write notes. Man wrote a note that night and says, wake me up at 7 o'clock in the morning or I'll be late for the job. He went to bed that night, woke up that morning at 8.30, wandering around, late, realized he wouldn't have 
place to go to besides the note that he read was a note from his wife that says, it's seven o'clock, dummy, get up. <laughs> Some of y'all get that after a while. But you know, a relationship like that doesn't happen overnight. Right. It's in Jubilee. It's in Jubilee message, but I hope it helps. Problems like that don't happen overnight. Problems in the ministry don't just pop up overnight. Now they can, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times those, those deep rooted issues, those things that we just can't get by and get beyond, it is the result of days and days and days of us looking at things that we have no control over. I find another observation here. This is the kind of wall it takes to build time. I noticed this as well. This is the kind of wall that's built by other people. Do you know tonight when the children of Israel came to the wall of Jericho, it was not them that built the wall. It was the inhabitants of Jericho. And can I say this this evening? There's some walls that you face that you had no control on them being erected. But nonetheless, there they are. Can I say it this way? There's some walls in your life that you're looking at tonight that other people built. <laughs> Days gone by, somebody hurt you. Somebody did you wrong. Right now, I'm dealing with a man in my church who from the age of two years old, his father started sexually molesting him to about the age of eight. And brother, I'm telling you what, this guy... All that has happened to him in his early years, it has it, it, affected everything in his life. I've been going verse by verse in Wednesday nights in the book of Colossians. Chapter number 1, I got to verse number 12 where it says, Giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet. Now I got to talking about our Heavenly Father. How He loves us and how He cares for us and how He provides for us and protects us and gives us life. That man came to me after church a couple Wednesday nights ago and said, Preacher, I cannot relate at all when you say that God is our Heavenly Father. He says, when I think about a father, he said, I think of anything but love. I think of anything but joy. I think of anything but provision. As a matter of fact, whenever I hear the word Father, he said, Preacher, it seems like my gut just begins to turn it over. Every area of his life. Right now, he's struggling with every relationship. He can't trust anybody. He doesn't have joy. Matter of fact, he's been on alcohol and drugs. He's turned to homosexuality. He's got all different things in his life. I'm telling you, he's faced a many of walls. Many of walls that me and you would never want to face. And at the end of the day, it wasn't him that built that wall. It was other people that built that wall. And tonight, it's true. Sometimes in our own error and in our own sin, in our own messing ups, we can build walls in our life that prevent us from going further. But sometimes the walls that we face, it wasn't our fault, it was somebody else. But you cannot allow others to control your joy in Jesus Christ. And sometimes, some people want to build so many walls, and if you're not careful, you'll think that that wall is there to protect you. We do that. We do that. That, that's why we put walls up between our friends and walls up between our spouses and walls up between our children, walls up between ministries, walls up between all of us. Let me tell you something. These walls were not there to protect them. These walls were there to prevent them from going further. And it doesn't matter. Listen, people's going to hurt us. People's going to backbite us. People's going to try to destroy our testimony. And if we'll allow people, if we'll allow people to dictate how far we go in this thing, we're not going to get very far. Can I tell you, I'm not in this thing because of other people. I'm in this thing because my Heavenly Father loves me. And He died for me. And I'm going further in my faith because i got a word from God to keep going and keep pressing and to keep moving on. Talking about the dimensions of this law. You see this? It's not, it's not just building today, it's built over time. It's built by other people. And then this wall, a third observation, is so big that you can't do anything about it. Yeah. These are not soldiers in Joshua chapter number six. Right. These are nomads and pilgrims who wasn't even birthed in Egypt. This is the generation that was raised and reared in the wilderness. 
They had no training in military skills. They had no ingenuity in and of themselves. They don't know how they're going to get beyond this thing. It was too big for them. The wall was too big. Let me say something. What they're looking at is what's only on the surface. But a wall this big, it's got to go deeper in places that you don't even see below the ground. They're dealing with something so wide, they can't handle it. So tall, they can't get beyond it. So deep, they don't know how to surmount it. Can I tell you tonight, hallelujah, when your wall is too big for you, aren't you glad it's not too big for you? Staying there. 
there will never get you everything God's promised you. And staying put is flat out rebellion to what God has commanded. And I'm not being mean tonight. I promise you, this is something I have to deal with in my own life. But I think the curse of America is apathetic Christians. I think the curse of our nation are Christians that say, I think we'll just stay right here. All the while, our youngins wonder, what does that water in that well taste like? Yeah. Daddy, what about them homes that God said we didn't have to build? And Daddy, what about them vineyards? God, we want to taste a little bit of glory. What about that milk and that, that honey that's flowing? Daddy, we haven't seen that yet. Daddy said, no, we're just going to stay right here. We ain't going to church on Wednesday night. We're just going to stay right here. We don't have to support the revival meetings. We're going to stay right here on Sunday nights and going back to the house of God. We're going to go to the lake and go fishing. My God, He blessed you with a bass boat and you use it on the Lord's day to go fishing. Somebody help me tonight. I'm saying, God, listen, you do all that and be saved, yeah. You do all that and come across the Jordan, yeah. You do all that and become some crazy things, yeah. But I tell you, you'll never get the full abundant life that God wants you to have. How about you tonight? I want everything He's got for me. I want to taste all of it. I want to sit on His table. I want to commune with Him. I want I mean, two. One's the cowardly approach. One's the complacent approach. And then the third is the compromising approach. Right. The compromising approach says this. Well, we'll not go back. And we certainly can't stay here. We'll just go around it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go around it. Yeah, we get some help. Come on, preacher. Right. See you, Jericho. Yeah. 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 You say, preacher, what's the problem with that approach? Well, as I've already said, flat out rebellion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flat out rebellion. And the other thing is this. Do you think for one moment, the moment you turn your back on the city of Jericho, what's the enemy going to do to the children of God? Yeah, yeah. Can I say this? And I feel the Holy Ghost and say it. There's some walls in your life that cannot exist in the land of promise. Down, God's got to do it. 
But he is going to choose to use their obedience in them walking around that wall. You say, preacher, well, just walk and that's easy. Well, I look at a lot of Christians today and I don't think it's that easy. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say that again. I look at a lot of Christians today. I don't know if walking is that easy or not. Right. It sounds real easy. But doing it is a different thing. So let me ask you this tonight. In conjunction with the dimensions of the wall that you're facing, how's your walk? How's your walk? Because a walk that is not obedient to the commands of the captain, of the host, of the army of God is a wall that will never fall. You, you, know, you want to know the reason why God's just commanding them to walk? He's doing that as a testimony so that when the wall does come down, none of those Israelites yeah. can take any claim that they're the one who did it. And even in our own life, you know how we get victory? God gives the victory. Yeah. But He gives the victory in conjunction with the way that we're walking with Him. And if we're not walking in accordance to the law of God and the Word of God and the Spirit of God, I would surmise and contend we've got walls that have been erected that we don't know what to do with. But I like this. As long as you are walking the way God commanded us to walk, it doesn't matter how
next 40 years, he had to walk them sheep around the desert. And it seemed as though God was doing nothing. Right. But do you know, well, glory, in the midst of it seemed like God was doing nothing, God was developing the man of God to be the great deliverer of Israel. Because over 40 years, as he is learning to draw water out of a well, God will eventually lead him to draw water out of a rock. And as God was leading him to tend the sheep of his father-in-law, God would eventually call him to lead the children of Israel in the desert.
He's with everybody that's got the victory. He's with the people that shout the glory. Oh, and he can even see in the distance all the promises of God. But down deep, yeah. are you listening tonight? Come on. Down deep, he kept a remnant of the wall that God destroyed. And what happened? The Bible says nobody else knew about it. God knew about it. Because they looked and saw Ai, God said, I ain't going to give you that city. You're going to be Why? Because there's sin in the camp. There's somebody that's got a piece of the wall. And as Achan thought he was going to get away with it. And all of his children jubilant about what God was about to do. Cause them out of the city and they die. They die. And the children dies. And his generation does not get the promises of God. Preacher, what is your point tonight? This is my point in the closing as I come with a song. God forbid this evening that the Holy Spirit bring to our attention walls in our life that need to fall. Yeah. And by His grace and His power and His authority, somehow or another, you come to these altars this evening and you find walls falling down flat all in your life. God forbid you get up from this altar and take a peace with you. Uh, and he, he you say, preacher, why? Because that very little thing may be the thing that prevents you from going further in your faith. I wonder, with a raised hand tonight, would you agree with me? We all have walls. The question is, will we do what God's commanded us to do to see them walls fall down? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed tonight. The preacher's going to come to the invitation. Right before he comes, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you looking at a wall this evening? Maybe you've heard about the promises of God and you've heard Granddaddy and Grandmama talk about the goodness and the blessings, the wells, the vineyards, the homes. And, and you know just up ahead God's already given you a word that it's there, but you just can't seem to go further in your faith. Maybe tonight God's brought to attention a wall that needs to be contended with. I wonder if you deal with it. Face it head on and ask God to give you the courage to do what He's commanded you to do. And don't take any peace with you as you go. Son's already come to the altar. We're standing our feet. The is going to come. Close out the door. See that wall come down for me. 